Now, Kepler's third law, uh, just like Newton, Kepler had three laws. Uh, Kepler's third law said the period of a planetary orbit was proportional to the radius of the orbit to the three halves power. So basically, you just looked at the periods of a bunch of the planets compared to how far they were from the, uh, this R is the distance from the sun, <coughs> or the distance, you know, if this is a moon, this would be the distance to the, the planet, or whatever. Uh, so it's the R, like from the law of gravitation, not the radius of the of the object itself. <coughs> um, so he, he found, decided that period was proportional to radius to the three halves. Um, and Newton, through Newton's laws, we were able to get a a more accurate, uh, to figure out what the proportionality was, um, if we if we consider it to be a circular orbit, more or less, it's not, it doesn't have to be quite circular, but uh, the centripetal force is caused by the gravitational force, so we put mv squared over r, and we set that equal to g times mass and I'm using big M and little m. This is the orbiting object. This is the orbited object. And I'm using that that way because this mass is the orbiting object over r squared. Well, uh, masses cancel out. Now remember, an alternate way of writing v for a centripetal, you know, the velocity around a circle is 2 pi r over t. And so... Using that and uh, canceling some stuff out, this r squared, I'm sorry, this r, one factor cancels with this r down here, and we move it over, and if we move stuff around, we figure out that our period then, uh, move stuff around, take a square root, all that fun stuff, is equal to 2 pi times r to the 3 halves over the square root of g times m. So... Kepler just figured out this proportionality, but using Newton's uh, law of gravitation and centripetal force, we can derive the exact value of the constant as 2 pi over root gm. And so all that the period of an orbit depends upon is the radius of said orbit. Uh, so, you know, if we want to know, this is essentially what they use to uh, to figure out... <coughs> masses of various planets uh, by measuring distances and and periods of, of their moons and, and things like that. Um, and this also allows us to place jet satellites in uh, what's called geosynchronous orbit. Um, a geosynchronous orbit means the period is one day or 24 hours. And we put satellites in geosynchronous orbit over the equator. So then, you know, if it's here as the, you know, this is a given point on the Earth's surface, as that point rotates around, the satellite rotates with it. And the reason that's useful is for things like weather and communications. Uh, it's useful to have a satellite that is uh, in the same place relative to the Earth's surface all the time. Uh, having that, you know, position in the same place is helpful. And because, and according to this equation right here, we can figure out their plug-in, uh, you know, 24 hours times 3,600 seconds per hour, plug in the period of the orbit that we want, we can figure out the distance from the center of the Earth, those uh, objects those satellites are uh, are rotating at. Um, another, I don't know, something that comes out of uh, Kepler's laws is related to uh, orbital maneuvers. Um, so it, let's say you're, you've got an object that's in a circular orbit. And the geosynchronous satellites are pretty much in circular orbits. So you've got an object moving in a circular orbit, going around, whatever. Okay, now, let's say this object fires a rocket right here and starts going faster. If it's going faster, 
then what's going to happen? Well, the period is going to decrease, which means that our average radius, this radius is to the three halves, if period decreases, then our our, our period would tend to decrease if we increase our velocity. But for an orbiting object, the, the period is, you know, it, it's not going to change too much. The radius, if we make it faster right here, the radius right here isn't going to change. Uh, but now this has uh, greater kinetic energy here. So as it orbits around, it's going to go out to a further distance on the other side. So by firing the rocket, the uh, orbit gets elongated on the other side. So it creates an ellipse, and we're still at the same position right here, but then when we come out here, we're, we make a, we may move the rocket now into an elliptical orbit instead of a, a circular orbit. So in order to, to move to another circular orbit, you have to fire rockets twice at opposite points in the orbit. So if you're on this orbit, you fire the rockets here, you move on to this ellipse, then you fire the rockets here again, and that'll put you back on a circular path that's now bigger. If you want to go to a smaller orbit, you reverse fire your rockets, and that'll create, again, an ellipse, and then you reverse fire over here, and you're onto a, a smaller circle. Um, this is kind of unrelated to Kepler's laws, but it's related to satellites, and, and it's something that is useful to know. Uh, the GPS, the Global Positioning System, uh, has there are a bunch of satellites floating around, and this is how the GPS works on whether you have a, a GPS device or your GPS on your phone or, or whatever. Um, GPS, there are a bunch of satellites, but at any given time to determine your location, three satellites have to be used. Uh, so we've got a tennis ball here. Let's say this is the Earth. And you've got a, if you've got a satellite in orbit somewhere above the Earth, uh, but the GPS knows, it sends out a signal that bounces off of your device and comes back. And the satellite knows how much time that takes, which means it knows how much distance the beam has traveled. And so it knows how far away you are from the satellite. But you're on the surface of a sphere, and the points that are equidistant from this satellite are in a circle. Any point on this circle is going to be equally distant from a, an object floating out in space. So one satellite gets you a circle. You do it with a second satellite, it gets you a second circle. And then the third satellite gets you a third circle that then overlaps and you figure out that point that you're on is the intersection of the three circles. So three satellites are needed to determine the location of any single device with the GPS, uh, which is why in the last few years they've launched a whole bunch more GPS satellites uh, because, you know, there are so many phones and devices and whatnot now that have GPS that they need a lot more bandwidth uh, to be able to pinpoint everyone's uh, position. Um, the, the location services on your cell phone is not using GPS. It's using uh, Wi-Fi. And I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think the Wi-Fi location services just has a a database of where uh, certain IP addresses come from. And so they know that if the router's here, you know, you must be within some distance of that. And they know that there's another router here and you must be within some radius of that. So by cataloging all the different Wi-Fi networks that you're in range of, uh, it can, you know, narrow down your location to a, a pretty small area. Uh, but that's different than, I think that's how it works, but I know it's different from the, the GPS.